um, and get started here. Let me share the screen. And I will go ahead and let Jason get started. You've got your mic. Well, good morning. <laughs> so how many people do we have on Zoom? Um, Okay, so my name is Jason Massadale, um, and uh, I, I don't think I've met hardly anyone that's in the room, and so I'm not sure on Zoom just yet. She's getting pulled up. Um, so if, if it's okay, we're going to go through the material. We're going to cover everything that's on here. I just want to preface and say my intention, though, today is, is for this to be more of a conversation. So we will cover the material, and I think it's really important just to have a conversation about it. Um, the, I didn't actually choose what they asked me to talk about, yet this is probably something I'm very passionate about. And so you could ask anyone on my team that's very passionate about this side of the deal because of the customer service aspect. So um, so I'm excited about that. Um, so who could share with me? Um, and when you talk, by the way, if you don't care, uh, tell me your name um, since I don't know most of the people. So, well, yeah. Shut off. No, I think it probably amplified it. Is that better? Is that better? Okay, good. Sorry about that, guys. So, um, so who could tell me or share with me what is something that has been one of your, your biggest ahas so far going through Ignite? Your favorite thing, biggest aha. Can you pass that back, please? My name's Andrew Scott. I'm not actually an agent, but I'm working for a team learning the business. And I just like how how much outside the box thinking there really is, how many solutions there are to problems that you wouldn't think of, or I wouldn't think of as a person new to the industry. You know, you're not just bound inside the fine lines of a contract. There's a lot of different routes you can take to get to the same result. So who else has uh, an aha that they could share? Let me grab the second mic. Uh, Patrick Lanigan. Um, one of the, well, a few things. Um, just sort of the um, the language that you can use as an agent, um, either dealing with other agents or dealing with your clients. Um, you know, certain things, you know, like, for example, like why? Like when you're speaking with an agent or a, a client, like why is that important? Instead of saying that, I say, what about that is important to you? So just an example of that. Um, also, just the um, just a lot of the strategies that a lot of the agents have used and shared with us about, you know, their experiences and how they um, have dealt with different problems. Because, you know, it's it's one thing to learn, you know, the the contracts and things like that. But um, you you certainly learn a lot just being in the business for however long and that's stuff that you can't you can't teach in a book so love it love it and i love the like language part of that so who else anyone okay one more how about one more before we move on one more for an aha that you've learned so far yeah please i uh, just one of the negotiation skills uh reverse contingency which I'd never thought of before, but you know, something simple that can kind of make it easier for a buyer to buy in a more competitive market. James. <laughs> All right, so I, I believe it's always important whether you're working with a client, if we're in a classroom, or even honestly, I do the same thing with my, my kids, um, always stating expectations. So um, before we kind of get into this, uh, here are the expectations um, for today. Um, to know the basic steps and contract close process, um, identify your contract close responsibilities when representing the buyer and seller, um, explore common issues that can occur in a contract close process, 
uh, leverage your resources um, and implement a post-close system to ensure referral for long-term win for clients. Um, so how did everyone do last week for, for your homework? Okay, well, share with me the, what, what was something good that came out of last week. So I believe last week you're supposed to talk to someone to, and talk to them about interview them about their contract close process. Is that right? Is that part of your homework? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I I will encourage you if you haven't done that after this class. Um, Honestly, even this class aside, it is very important to sit down and talk to a, a team or someone that's contract closed, single agent, doesn't matter, someone that's been in the business and talk to them about what their process looks like. So highly encourage that. Really? Yeah. I use, <coughs> I've been using this for the past few weeks with my team. Okay. And uh, She is awesome, and there are a couple that are really good, um, and I've used some of them myself. Uh, I always am the firm believer, well, we're going to go into a little bit about that, so yeah, it's good, but I still would encourage you to sit down and interview someone, find out why they do what they do. Um, so what about your calls? You guys been lead generating, doing it in every class, right? How, how's that going? What are some good things that have been coming, and what are some challenges you're seeing? Come from value, I understand that. That so having trouble making cold calls, catch them off guard. Um, so trying to come from value. So what are some other challenges you're having? So I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. Anyone online even? So for those of you online, he said that it's went pretty well calling people you've worked with in the past and your your sphere and, and letting them know what you're doing now and it's gone pretty well. So now what team are you on? Stone. Stone. Okay, awesome. Um, any other challenges you can think of that's come up? Okay. So um, what about uh, what about script practicing? How's that been going? I agree with that. So, um, so have you guys been doing the affirmation before you get started? <laughs> nope. Okay. Okay. Well, so here's what I would like to do because this is what I do. So, um, before you get on the phone, it's always good to practice before you're doing it in a time when it costs you money, right? So, rather than practicing in those moments where it costs you money, 
some practice before you get on the phone. So I would say, let's take five minutes and just role play with someone. Um, I would encourage you on the, whoever's being the person calling, don't be so difficult that they can't get through. Also, don't be so easy that they walk through it. Like, give them some pushback because that's role play, right? Um, and then, um, does anyone have a piece of paper in front of them? And then online, uh, so do the same thing. So write down what are your intentions when you make calls today? At the end of this, when we meet back up, what do you want to say, here's what I accomplished? Is it just getting X amount of calls in? Is it setting an appointment? Like what are your actual intentions? Writing it down, what, is your, what are your intentions? Who would share with me what they wrote down before we get started? I wrote uh, make connections or impressions on the person I'm talking to, you know, so they remember me. They, um, you know, if they think of real estate, they're like, oh, I just talked to that real realtor on the phone. Uh, get personal info, you know, um, email addresses, um, phone numbers, and then, you know, hopefully uh, schedule appointments to meet with them. Okay. So how many people what's your goal for how many in the next 20 minutes okay so you're gonna get through five conversations is that right okay who else um probably either like a referral or like an appointment because a lot of people that like i know are like like younger so like uh, i guess getting referrals from like maybe relatives that they know okay so your goal is to get a referral is that right? Either a referral or an appointment. Okay. Okay. So what do you guys think is the reason? What's the reason for for writing down your intentions? What else? If you don't have an, a goal of what you're wanting to accomplish, anything is a win. If you don't have, if like, if you don't set an intention or a goal to what you're doing, anything is a win. And by writing it down, you're visualizing what success is going to look like. So therefore, you're working towards it, even when, even if you don't even realize it, you're working towards it. So okay, so pick a partner. Let's just take a couple minutes real quick and and let's role play. Um, you guys have scripts? Yeah. Okay. And I think there's two over there and and we'll just take a couple minutes and
All right, guys. Well, how did uh, how did it go script practicing? Yeah. <laughs> He's set up for success already. <laughs> All right. Well, so let's take the next 20 minutes. Let's make our calls. Let's uh, win the morning, win the day, win the morning, win the day. So next 20 minutes. Sound good?
about four more minutes for those on Zoom. All right, so how did it go? I got two people out. <laughs> so can you guys online hear me? Are we ready to get back? Okay, so who has a success story for the last uh, 20 minutes or so? Anybody? Actually, that would be great. Here, let's set that. Up. So this is Brian. Uh, talked to a guy that came through as a Facebook lead. Uh, he's out in Montana right now, but I scheduled a follow-up call for Monday to set an appointment for next week to sit down and discuss what he wants to buy as well as selling his place. A Facebook lead led to that. Le led to a conversation that went to, uh, you know, and it. It's essentially a cold call. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. But Brian. it's warm-ish. Yeah. But yeah. I, I heard you. I was listening to you. Uh, that's awesome. Who else? Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm just texting texting a bunch of people on Facebook because I called everybody on my phone. Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, just family members catching up with them and found out my cousin has went through a divorce and looking for a place to buy, so. Trying to set up an appointment with him right now. Okay. Awesome. Who else? Anybody? How about on Facebook? Anybody on Zoom? Okay. So what would you say? Uh, you know, John Maxwell says that, um, uh, what was it, that, it's not the learning 
that matters. It's the reflection upon the learning that really matters. That's why I keep coming back to what did you learn? What's your aha? So we took 20 minutes. We made some calls. So what would you say you took away from that experience? We wrote down our intentions. No judgment in this room. So what would you guys say you learned over the last 20 minutes from that? James, will you? I, I wasn't able to have any successful calls, but I did just the whole thought of writing down your intention before you, I guess not even just phone calls, but doing anything before you dive into something, write the specific goal down. That really helps focus and can make everything more productive, not just calls, but anything you're working on. I love that. What else? Someone else. Give me one more. Anybody? Um, I learned that, or I guess an aha that I had was um, I probably need to change up a little bit who I was calling at 10.30 a.m. because a lot of people I called were busy and said call back or <laughs> okay. talk to them later. So probably should have called people that I knew maybe wouldn't be diving into paperwork or doing something where I could have maybe had a conversation with them. Okay. So call a different time for some of those folks. That's good. So it looks like uh, Aaron on here said that uh, – Set a buyer's appointment. That's awesome. Good job. Aaron, was that uh, through a, your sphere of influence? Was a, a Facebook lead? Was a cold call? Well, so just curious. Um, I set an appointment while we were on break, too. Mine was I cold called someone that owns a lot, and I just said, I just asked if they would sell it. I just, that simple. I said, I've got a buyer that's looking over there in that area. I was just curious if you'd be interested in selling your property. And they said, yes. So I set an appointment to meet with them tomorrow. So, so it was that simple. There wasn't even, I didn't even have to have a conversation around it. It was immediately, yes. <laughs> so, so awesome. Any, any other aha's takeaways last 20 minutes? Is it harder than you thought? Are you finding progress? Are you getting better every week? Feedback? Yeah. I see a, a head shaking, guys. It gets easier. I mean, it, there's definitely progress. I'm still really new, but um, yeah, it gets easier. You know, you start getting them down and you start going through motions and it's kind of a breeze, you know? Yeah. Do you know how you get 100% better? It's, no, it's really easy. There's a formula to it. You know how to get 100% better? For 100 days. <laughs> it's just that simple. I read that the other day. I was like, that is very true. It doesn't really matter what we're talking about, but just get 1% better every day. Okay, so thank you for that. And I think we've got to be able to set the microphone on right there if you want to. Um, so, so let's go into this. Um, so talking about uh, contract to close. Now, I, I know that you mentioned that, uh, that someone said that you, you hire a company out, and a lot of people do. Um, and, and here in a minute, there is a, a section for it, but I'll share with you kind of my experience um, when I was getting started in, in real estate. Uh, I set out to, in the beginning, I was like, I want to know everything about every, like all parts of the transaction. I wanted to be so knowledgeable on the lending side that I almost knew more than the lender. I don't, obviously. I'm just saying like that was my intention though is, I wanted to know the, what they know, so that way when my client asks, I'm the resource. And same thing for contract close. Um, you know, I, although I have someone that, that does my contract close on my team, I, I still know every part of the transaction, and I probably drive them nuts by asking them questions on it. So, um, so it's still, it, it's important to know, um, like, all the parts of it. So... Let's just kind of brainstorm for a minute. So this is a discussion. This is not me teaching. This is us as a class, all coworkers. Um, oh, you said it from your sphere. Good job. So uh, Aaron on here said that her point, buyer appointment was a uh, sphere. So awesome. So close on time. What could you do to make sure the deal closes on time? Communicate with the title company. Okay, so why?
communicate with Tyler Company? Yep, good job. What else? So putting it on your calendar and having a calendar invite everybody that's involved in it. Okay, what else? Talk to the lender before you write a contract. Why would we talk to the lender before we write a contract? To make sure that they can close it within the time period that you want it to be done. 100% yes. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, if you have two lenders, will both of them have the same time frame to be able to close the deal? No. Why is that? Uh, their processes and systems. I have no idea why. Actually, that's a really uh, great answer. But each so, one of each one of them has different processes and systems. That's true. Yeah. So it's always important to know whoever the lender is and what their time frame is to get it closed. So great answer. Great explanation to the answer. But here, yeah. So what else? How about, the, how about this? What happens if the deal doesn't close on time? What is the perception the client has on us? Even if it's not our fault, by the way. Even if it's not our fault, they uh, they have a bit of a negative view of, well, everyone involved typically, but definitely your agent since you were the one in charge of everything from their point of view. Set expectations up front and let them know about the time frames for government loans. And that if things look like they're not going to close on time, not to worry about it, we can always amend the contract and move forward. There are ways to you know, uh, negotiate that. So set expectations and make sure you communicate with your lenders, right? Yep, good. What else? Make sure we close on time. What else is there? So, go ahead. You might, even want to, you might even want to, like, if it's a busy time to schedule uh, inspections ahead of time, so then they, that they'll be on your timetable. Yep, that's true. So, Aaron on Facebook or on uh, Zoom, um, share with me a little bit more what you're what you're saying. So, you're saying, um, to, because you don't know what you're doing, you want to be thorough. Oh, I'm sorry. Gotcha. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, that is true. Yes. I, I, I mean, hey, if you've been in the business long enough, you'll have a deal that just goes way too long and something goes bad and underwriting, whatever. You know, I, I had one close three weeks after our, our time we were supposed to close. And even though I had communicated with them thoroughly, done my job, you know, to make sure all my ends were in order. And it, because the lender couldn't close it in time, and I was working for the seller, not the buyer, I mean, my client was furious, even at me, everybody involved, they're upset. It didn't matter that I had nothing to do with the lender. It, it was still reflected out on me. So, yeah. So what else do you think we could do to make sure it closes on time? By the way, is anyone taking notes? This might be a really great thing to write down if you're not. So before you answer that question, so here's where, at this point in the, in, in the contract, here's where you need to think of yourself as the project manager, right? You're the project manager and you're orchestrating this whole thing. So, and everything we're gonna talk about moving forward, um, even though you might work with some really great lenders, some really great agents and some really great title companies, always, assume that you have to check on it because they're not doing it. Now, they might be great and they might do it, and you're the project manager. If it doesn't get done on time, it's your fault. So always assume you have to, and sometimes, sometimes they don't, you know? So what else can we do to make sure it closes on time? Give me, give me one more. Got all the steps, yeah. Um, <laughs> might set the expectation that they know that they're not to go buy furniture before closing, right? 
<laughs> yeah. Is anyone? I don't know if you're raising your hand. I'm sorry. No. Okay. What about uh, to make sure it's a smooth transaction? Yeah. So over communicate. There is no such thing as over communicating deals. What else? Yeah, that goes back in with like, well, we're fortunate to have a good uh, contract to close process and that we've got ironed out and have someone taken care of for us. So that obviously helps make the process smooth as possible. And we have one dedicated person to focus on those things. So let me ask you this. Um, just, you know, I should ask this earlier. So who's, with a raise of hand, who's been in the business for uh, a year longer? Two. Um, six months or less? Six months? Less? Okay. So the two, how long have you been in the business? Three years. Three years? And a year. Okay. It just helps me gauge kind of like where we're at. So, so what else do you think we could do to make sure we have a smooth transaction? Okay. How do you make sure you have a good relationship with the people you work with? Have a genuine relationship. Yeah, I love that. It's very good. Have a good relationship with the other agent as well. I 100% agree with you. So I, not to say it doesn't happen. I very rarely miss out on multiple offer situation because of that. Very rarely do I not get it. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what else? You're right. Organization, yeah. Uh, right here first, and we'll come over there. Oh, um, kind of uh, back to their their points of um, you know your relationship with uh, the agent and um, you know everyone involved is just to you know have open communication with them, be available for phones, emails, you know, text messages, whatever. Um, you know, just just be ava just be available when they have questions or anything like that, just to make it a smoother process, so nobody's you know getting frustrated um, with you or other way around. Yeah, um, I heard, and I I can't remember who this said it because I was at uh, one of the family reunions, and one of the agents said, if the client calls and asks me a question throughout the process, I haven't done my job because I should always tell them before they even know to ask the question. That's not a judgment towards you. I, I just remember hearing that and I was like, whoa, hold on just a second, you know? And I got to think about it and I'm like, okay, well, what if I did a, what if I wrote down every question that they've asked me and made a process around that? Just a thought. So I'm like brand new, like three weeks. And so I'm just wondering, like, I understand the agent relationships is good, um, but if your offer was lower, why would they not go with the higher one? Like if I'm the, if I'm the seller, I'm like, I don't care if you have a good relationship. That's five grand more. Great question. What am I missing? I guess. So does anyone think they can answer that? No, it is a really great question. No, it's a, I'm really glad you asked that question. I've worked with agents before that I know don't um they don't hit the deadlines they don't follow up well um sometimes they i wouldn't say lie but <laughs> exaggerate some of the truths and it gets you in a situation where the deal doesn't close and then your seller ends up losing more money than they would have if they'd taken an offer with an agent who's on their game and gets things done that you know you can close the deal with yep i agree with that um you know i am a you know very new agent but i have um i've talked to more experienced agents um kind of on this topic about you know your relationship with the other or like you know the multiple offer situation um and you know some agents um are have like a are notorious for like you know not just being difficult to work with 
and um, nobody's told me they've done this directly, but you know, they have said, you know, uh, you may send in an offer and if you have a terrible relationship with that other agent, they won't even bring it to their clients. They're not, <laughs> to be clear, you're supposed to. <laughs> well, yeah, you are, but I've heard I, nobody. And like I said, nobody here has and Keller Williams has told me they've done that, but they have heard of other, you know, people at other agencies, you know, they get an offer from somebody they just hate for whatever reason. And they'll just, you know, oops, that didn't, didn't see that one come across. Um, I've had clients, so I've had sellers in multiple offer situations say, who's their agent? How well do you know them? What do you know about them? Have you worked to deal with them before? How did that go? Do you know their lender? What's your experience with them with that lender? I mean, like, I, I've had sellers, and matter of fact, I usually will set the expectation with my, with my sellers that I have a great relationship with agents. I mean, I know almost every agent, not all of them, obviously, but I don't know anyone in here. So you're the listing agent in that situation. You have a good rapport with that person. So you're just presenting the facts to them. So you're not like, I, if it was me, I'd go with these other people. You're just like, I know this person. I know that we have a good relationship. They get deals done. I'm not sure about this other person. And that's, so you're presenting all that to your seller, but you're so, not trying to influence them. Like, So let me go back. You're right. I, I just give the seller the information, let them make their own decision. I don't ever tell them what to do. Sure. I mean, that's so, what we do in CMAs too, yeah. right? I, I, I don't, because if I told them what to do and they made the wrong decision or, you know, it didn't go well, then it right. would be my fault. I just give them the information so they can make the right decision. So. Um, oh, you know, I'll, t I, I'll be honest and I'll say, you know, I had to deal with them a year ago. Here was how it went. Um, it went very smooth. Um, the lender that they, I, I mean, I'll, I'll give them, I'll tell them about it. You know, if, if it's an agent I don't know, I'll say I don't know anything about them. If it's a new agent, I'll say it's a new agent. I, I will I will tell them my experience. I will not say it's a bad agent. Okay. But you're very much like Yeah. Okay. I, I will tell my experience. I won't categorize that agent as being good or bad. Yeah, kind of let them make their own decision. Um, I, I will say, you know, if I have an agent that I've closed a lot of deals with and they're very on top of things and things go very smooth, uh, I make sure they know that. I mean, it, because it does matter. If, if I allow my seller to take an offer that I think will fall through, I, I mean, I don't make that decision for them yet at the same time. I wanna make sure I'm doing my due diligence for them. So to go back, how do I win that offer as a buyer's agent? So I think that was your original question. Um, hey, James, mm -hmm. how many offers you got on this property so far? Wow, that is amazing. Congratulations. Hey, you know what? Since I, 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 I'm so hoping that uh, we have an opportunity to work together because my client's intention is to get this house bought. So would you care to let me know if you get any more offers on this property? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Would you say you're presenting them? Uh, it would be Tuesday night at 2 o'clock. So Tuesday night at 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Awesome. James, is it okay? If uh, maybe I call you Tuesday, uh, maybe about 1.30, just to confirm to see how many offers you have. Because uh, my clients, their intention, they're going to buy this house. Yeah, you might want to call a little bit earlier, though. Okay. I mean, just to make sure we got plenty of time to get the offer in. Awesome. What's your, what is your deadline for where you won't accept any more offers? Uh, probably at noon. At noon. Okay, mm -hmm. so is it okay if maybe I call you at five minutes after that? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, you know what? I had an, I had I had a house the other day, had seven offers on it, and two offers came in. The agents didn't even call and tell me they were sending me an offer. Um, I so understand that. I know. Like, so Evan Deshawn, um, one time uh, years ago, I think this was like 2014. Um, I sent him an offer, and he called me immediately and said, "He's the listing agent. I'm the buyer's agent." And he calls and he goes. Hey, Jason, I just received your offer, and I wanted to call and say thank you for bringing me an offer, and I will present your offer, blah, blah, blah. and he told me all the deals. Now, I'm not saying I do that on every deal, especially it, on one of these that gets crazy. I will say as a listing agent, though, man, how much respect does that show to the other agent on this deal that you called and thanked them? I, I was, I think one of my favorite things anyone's ever, another agent's ever done for me is just 
called and said thank you. Yeah. So, okay, so we kind of got off, off the topic a little bit. So what else do you think we could do to make sure this is a smooth transaction? So there, I believe there's a big one that no one's mentioned yet. Anyone on Zoom? Anyone by? So does anyone have it on their s schedule after they accept a contract, buyer or seller side, or I mean, just an appointment for when they're going to be calling the lender? How often? So anyone else have thoughts on that? So I actually, on I don't do it. My contract close on my team. So every Monday is lender day. Every Monday they call the lenders. Every contract we have, they're calling the lenders. It doesn't matter if we just talked to them on Friday at five o'clock. <laughs> we call every Monday and we, we do a follow-up and we let them know up front when we get a deal from them, just so you know, we're gonna be calling you every Monday for an update. I mean, I love it when the lender says, hey, I know you're gonna call us anyways, we just thought we'd call you. So, so. Um, remember the what we said before, you can't over-communicate, so. What about the title company? How often should you talk to them? Short version is, I, I say we have it on our calendar for when we're gonna be talking to all parties. So same thing with the other agent, we wanna talk to them at least once a week. Even if there's nothing to talk about, like we still wanna talk to them. So, you know, I, I might, Say, hey, James, I, I know you've got an inspection scheduled tomorrow. Um, I just want to give you a call and just see if there's anything you need from me or if you're good to go. I have no idea. <laughs> but you get the point. <laughs> I, was just, I was just being silly. So, yeah. So, yeah, someone commented that Evan Deshaun is, is a professional. He is, yeah. Evan is awesome. So, okay, what about this last one? So how do you win future business by giving great customer service? Okay. Asking for referrals post-close. Okay, yep, what else? Giving good customer service when you have a good experience, it's just, that's just gonna do a lot of the work for you for getting future business and they're gonna refer they're going to refer you to other people. The other agent's going to have a good opinion of you, which it's all going to, a lot of it's just going to work for itself when you do good customer service. What else? You're right. Yes. What else? What else? I don't remember where I heard this. It may have been in here, uh, but it's kind of stuck with me. But a real estate transaction is kind of like a relationship in itself, a mini relationship. And after the closing is the, the closing is the divorce. And you just kind of don't let the divorce just happen, like slowly let them down and break that contact over time, like maybe say, a week later, call, follow up, see how the house is, you know, see if everything's good. Two weeks, maybe a month after that, and just kind of slowly take those reins away. Uh, because you're in so much contact with the person throughout the transaction, they feel a sense of loss mm -hmm. uh, with you. And again, I don't remember where I heard it or read it. Was it here? Was it? Yeah, it was. I couldn't remember, but that stuck with me pretty good. 
Yeah, it's very true. You know, I uh, was a Tim Heil out of uh, Austin, Texas. Um, I'm, I went to one of his classes and he talked about how to ask for referrals from clients. And he said that his team, um, when they first meet a client, they, they let them know, I'm going to be asking for a referral four times, but I want, I want to earn it. And he said, I'm going to ask for a referral when we write a contract. Or was it? Yeah, when, when, when we find the right house and we put it under contract. Um, when we, let's see, what was it? I know closing, 30 days after closing. Um, it was something, I, there was one more. I don't remember what it was. Oh, maybe it was, a, it was contract, inspection, closing, 30 days after. Yes? Please. Mike, the man himself. <laughs> so this is where I love command because what my goal is the minute they buy a house from me, I'm starting to touch base with them for five years down the road when they're buying again. So we have a closing letter that goes out like a week after saying, thank you. You know, just some basic follow up there. But then we have four smart plans we put them on. We immediately put them on the home anniversary. So that in a year, they're going to get notice from me saying, hey, you've been in your house a year. We also do the quarterly call plan. So once every 13 weeks, they come up and it reminds me to call them. Like my January people, I'm not asking if they want to buy a house. I'm just saying, hey, hope your year's off to a great start. We're short of houses. If you know of anybody that's thinking of buying or selling, please just keep us in mind. Then their birthday plan. They're, they're giving all this information at closing. Just ask for their birthday while you're there. <laughs> and then put them on the birthday plan. I did a different one from command because I, I made one that will text them happy birthday from Brown Town Homes. Um, if you don't and you use Twilio, it'll just say happy birthday and they won't know what the number is. So, so many times I did that at first, they, I'd get a message back. Hey, I got a new phone. Who is this? I'm like, no, you didn't. You just don't know who it is. <laughs> and then finally, monthly neighborhood. So the minute they buy a house, I put them on the monthly neighborhood thing starting the beginning of the next month. So once a month, they're getting info from me about their neighborhood. Just so that's, I think that's 18 touches in a year, just letting command do it. So that's the way I stay in touch with the, uh, the winning the future business. So awesome. Love it. Good job. Okay. What else? Let's, let's hear one more idea. Um, one more get, you know, getting like a, <clears throat> getting a, an actual review from your client that you can, you know, put on your social media, make it all look all pretty, you know, uh, yeah. So just getting people, you know, getting people out there be like, Oh, wow, this guy does obviously did a great job for them. Uh, maybe I should give him a call. You guys ever seen a realtor take a picture with their clients? Those little cute little signs. Oh, do you? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. All right. Lots of great ideas. You guys writing this down? So who would uh, volunteer to read this for me out loud? Please. The first part of the real estate sales process is the hard, focused work of making connections and achieving agreements. The second part is the wide-eyed, vigilant guardianship of the transaction until it makes it to closing. What do you think about that? So remember how I said earlier about, you know, knowing everybody's job, know their process, things like that. Um, and, and making sure you're, you think of yourself like the project manager. Um, who in here is, who, who in here does their own contract close or is going to? <laughs> do you, you have, you have, and do you now do it yourself? So have you guys, uh, so those of you that have been doing it, do you guys already have a system? Do you guys have a written system that you use? Okay. 
I use a third party app called Folio. And uh, basically, you could put in all your deadlines directly from your contract and it set notifications just to stay on track. And uh, it was just project management, basically. It takes up a lot of time. <laughs> it does take a lot of time? Gotcha. Okay. What, what, makes, what takes a lot of time with it? Project management. When you have, if, if you got four closings in a month and you're managing all four of those to make sure they're hitting the deadlines and everybody's on track, it just takes time. So, um, now when, when Jen came and talked, you said she gave you a checklist of things to look on your contract. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so who in here would show hands when you meet with your buyer, let's say you meet with a buyer, you walk them through what the entire process is going to look like up until the contract. Um, who in here has it written down to give to them at the same time? Okay. But good idea if you don't. I mean, no judgment if you don't, because those of those of us that do have it written down at one point in time didn't, right? <laughs> so just a thought, if you don't have your process written down, um, always give it to them in writing too. So um, what about... Uh, When you're setting expectations um, with your buyer, uh, do you have it written down for them? Like what it, and there's no judgment if you do, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just wondering, like, does anyone have it written down? Like what it looks like once it goes under contract, what the process looks like? And I did have a little question about that. Like you're saying meet with your buyers, I'm assuming like before they're even, em you're even employed by them. We we don't have anything that officially go we, we bring a presentation in writing okay. but we don't have anything that actually goes to them um we we have an auto another smart plan from command an automatic email uh campaign that just goes every few days when they when they list with a, it's listing specific this one would you say it'd be good to have something like that at the time like when we're meeting with them face to face before they're employed versus you know, after the fact, coming within a week of them and being employed with us? Uh, the best thing I can do is just share with you what I do. So, and you'll have to make your own decision for your own systems, you know. So, if, when I meet with, uh, I like to set expectations. I, it really is important to me because if I set the expectations up front on what will happen and even what some of the potential challenges and hurdles might be, then they're prepared for them. Like, I can't tell you how many times... Actually, you know what, I'll just say my son. Like my son, if I tell him beforehand that this could go wrong or this could be bad, he's okay. But if I don't tell him and we get there and then he's like, man, I just, I wish you would have told me that was gonna happen. Like my buyers are kind of the same way. You know, if I just say, hey, right now in Nixon, I think there are 42 houses actively listed. There are 92 under contract. I'm like, there are more buyers than there are houses. We might have to be very aggressive on going to look at the house and when we go to make an offer, you might have to offer over list price to get it. I just want to make sure you understand that. Now, we'll have a strategy that might be different for every house, yet just know that's a hurdle that we might have to overcome. When I call you and I say there's a house that came on the market, we're going to need to be aggressive and go look at it. Uh, and you know what I mean? Like, whatever that looks like. So I, I like to set those expectations. And I have a buyer's presentation. I'll, I'll do that. So... But if nothing else, I make sure they understand what the expectations and challenges are. That's me personally. So, um, you know, whatever the system you use, I would say, remember how we talked about just being 1% better? Um, you know, look at your systems. What, what are you using now? Um, after this class, I would encourage you to, if it's Nicole, did you say Nicole, who's you using? I'm sure she has a written system. I mean, I'd ask her for her written system. What does that look like? Because then you could share that. Here's what the system, here's what it will look like when you go under contract. Like, you don't even have to create your own. You can take it from another agent. So that would actually be a great, I bet she has an amazing system. So thoughts? I'll slow down. What do you guys think about that? I like the 1% thinking it because we've just got done making all of our systems and there were about like, we're just about to roll them all out and, you know, 
there's obviously going to be flaws that we haven't anticipated. I mean, hopefully not. Hopefully we did it perfectly, but kind of doubt that. So I like to s evaluate after every single deal, every step of the deal, if you can. Yeah, and I'll tell you, well, like on my team, when I can't tell you, well, almost every single deal, not almost every single deal, but as we, either in the middle of it or at the end of it, um, Polly's on my team, she's my contract close. We'll say, hey, just we need to make sure that this goes into our system next time to go right here. Like we even have for, I mean, open houses, whatever that is. And then we'll look and say, what didn't go well? What questions did they come and ask us? You know, what could we do so that maybe next time we can answer that question before it comes out? So, just a thought. So let's walk through. So do you guys have the sheet that walks through the contract to close, like the whole process? You guys have that sheet in your book? Okay. And I know some of you have been in the business a while. A few of you are new. Let's just walk through this process real quick. Um, and, and feel free to stop, ask questions. Because I, I just want you to understand what this entire process looks like. Um, so, yeah. okay, so obviously we get an offer. What are the three things that can happen from an offer? Rejection, acceptance, counter. Okay, now we've got an offer, uh, or we've got a contract. Now what? For inspection. So in our market, what's the typical inspection time frame? Contract says 10, you can change that date to a lot of people do 15. Why do they do 15? I would just allow for error. Yeah, just busy schedules, give a little more flexibility. Yeah. Okay, so. So who in here has ordered an inspection before? Okay. Do you have, so this comes back to remember the relationships and we were saying how key it is. So if you have an inspector you use a lot and you have a good relationship with them, I mean, they will, they will fit into your timeline. If you don't have one you work with well, then you might need every bit of that 15 day. I honestly, I, I I always do the 15 myself, yet I'm completely through the inspection in seven days or less. I mean, usually five. So I, I can almost guarantee that I'll have it the same week, I mean, barring something coming up on the inspection that we don't foresee. Okay, so we have our inspection. Now what happens after that? So either we, we agree, we accept it as is, or walk away, or don't agree. Yeah. Okay, so we all understand that. What about the title company? What's the next step? Title commitment. So just out of curiosity, no judgment, do you guys read that? <laughs> title commitment? You know, I would encourage you at some point in time to talk to your title company, have them explain it to you. Maybe you take a step further, what does their process look like? So you can explain it to your clients. Um, on, on the, I think it's the acceptance page B, I think it's like page two or three, you know, list out the exceptions for title policy. If there's a problem in the title, then it's usually listed there in red. So it's just good to always know, I mean, I always look at mine. Um, if it's land or something, I always check to make sure you're selling the right property. That does happen. So, Sam at Titan Title teaches a title class. Oh, awesome. I didn't know that. So, I'm not sure how you sign up for it, but I'll have, uh, I'll find out. So, but yeah, it looks like Sam at Titan offers that. So, and I'm sure if you have somewhere you close regularly, they would probably do it too. Um, Sam at Titan is very good. So, um, okay. So then, what comes after title? You get the title work, or 
Everything looks okay there. What's next? Hey, they did. <laughs> so appraisal. So appraisal would be next, right? How far out are appraisals right now? It depends a little bit. You know, some seems like some banks have a group of underwriters or a group of appraisers that they use seem to get out there pretty quick, but two to three weeks at least. So, so you get your appraisal. What happens if it doesn't appraise for the sales price or higher? So we negotiate or walk, okay? Okay, so break that down. Yep. Well, the um, the buyer could make the difference up in cash. Okay. Uh, the seller could come down the price. You could meet in the middle somewhere, or you could just walk away and say, you know, we can't do it. Yep, that's right. Because, and that does happen. I know in, I mean, when you're in a market where things keep going higher and higher, Quickly, it happens more and more. So, um, okay, what's next? <laughs> yeah. So, when in this process do you make sure your buyer has the utility set to go in their name? No right or wrong, just wondering what your process looks like. Thank you. If you didn't, if you don't have that in your system, make sure you write that down. That's a good thing to write down. Because it sucks to get to closing and and <laughs> and then you tell them. So okay, so when and then next thing you're gonna get the settlement statement, right? You're gonna make sure the settlement statement's right. Um, does everyone understand the settlement statement? Does anyone oh, okay? So then I'm gonna go back to I would ask the title company to explain how that works, like go over the settlement statement. I would say, Sam or whoever you're closing and ask them, hey, will you just explain this so I understand moving forward what everything on here means from the title's perspective. Um, so I would encourage that because, you know, especially on the title fees, I mean, they break that up differently. It looks different. It looks different depending on where you close. Some of them put it more in a lump sum and some of them break it down. So anyways, I'd make sure you understand it so that way you can explain it to your clients. Um, and then closing funds. Okay. So I kind of went through quickly. Any questions on that or anything in, within there you want to talk about a little bit more? So this will be my first closing okay um, we are currently we've got the inspections done um, no appraisals needed I've talked to the the lender on the buy side he said that the buyers good to go um, so now it's a matter of uh, the other escrow in, in, in instructions okay is that is that right is that, that part of the process we're in right now Okay. I understand it. So no appraisal. Yeah. Has it been through underwriting? Um, it's a good question. Okay. It's a, the, it's my, uh, I'm representing the seller on the, on the, on the listing. Um, but then they're also my buyer on the other side, but that one's, they're both closing on the same day. We're just at a different part in the process on each one. So uh, I'm going to share from my experience or what I do. That's not telling you to do this. It doesn't matter to me who I'm representing. I want to know. I, I'm probably calling the lender even if I'm working for the seller. Not probably. We call the lenders every week. It doesn't matter what side we do this on. I want to know an update. And I want to know an update. I want to know. So we've got a board in my office and, it, and every deal we have and it says, when was the appraisal ordered? When's it due back by? And then I want to know when the day it goes into underwriting and when do they expect it out? Like. All the deals, doesn't matter if it's buyer or seller, I want to know all of them. And matter of fact, we actually, um, in my office, we talk about every deal every day. We just do a quick recap of here are the contracts. I, like, I have one that's due back today. Appraiser's not even been to the house. I'm like, this is going to be interesting. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> but I follow it. So, did that answer your question?
Yeah. So it'll have to come out of underwriting for them to get a settlement statement for the buyer. Um, if you if your if your title company on the seller side has or if well I would probably will know that have they ordered the payoff for the house yet. So well we've set a closing date for the for the listing. Um, that's already on the books with Hogan. We've gotten any, any of the escrow checks and all that. Um, so about a week out from closing on the seller side, the title company will order a payoff for the house. Okay. And it's usually good for 10 days. Um, and they, they, they order it towards the end because it's only good for 10 days. Okay. And that, so they have to close it and get the money there in that 10 days. Okay. Um, and they can't give you a settlement statement on the seller side till they have that payoff. Gotcha. Okay. So, any other questions? Good questions right here. No? All right, so page 18. So if you don't have a checklist already, here is a checklist. Um, I would probably take this. I would go, I would talk to, and it goes for a couple of pages. And, you know, talk to Nicole or talk to, another team and someone's been in the business and see how does this compare to yours? What do you do differently? Um, what mistakes did you make in putting yours together? You know, what did I learn from? So, um, so moving forward, go to page 20, unless you want to talk about checklists, if there's anything that you have questions on, I kind of went over that bit there. Yeah. So, um, before we move on, does, does everyone, how about this? Does, have you guys walked through what it looks like to turn in for compliance, make sure you get paid? Okay. I know that they have a class here. So I would recommend going through that. And I'll just say <laughs> something that I have to work on constantly. So paperwork is not my strong suit, as in I don't enjoy doing paperwork. So I'm constantly having to remind myself on it. I say that, um, for me personally, making sure that all my paperwork is done and approved before I go to closing. And that way, if you need to get some cleanup paperwork for compliance, you can get it at closing. If you wait until after closing, it is a nightmare to try to get this accomplished. <laughs> so if you need cleanup paperwork, make sure everything is approved through uh, the market center before you go to closing. And by the way, if you, uh, if you have some cleanup paperwork, um, you can always send it to the title company and ask them to get it signed by all parties. So, I mean, let the other agent know that you're doing this, but if you want to, you can always do that. Okay, uh, page 20. I heard someone say at the beginning of this, one of their ahas from Ignite was problem solving and how many different solutions there are to different problems. So looking on here on page 20 and 21, it goes through some potential things that could go wrong. So I'd like for you to take about 10 minutes, you break up into groups two or three, and, and let's just mastermind a little bit. Like what, uh, what, are the, what, what are the solution that could come up? And then let's talk about some of these takeaways from it. And I'll go around and, and be a part of every conversation a little bit, so.
I wouldn't count on this, but I also know that it's not a political conference. I know that Biden said that he wants to lower the, the standards for FHA to make it whatever that means. It was a news article out there. Like, 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 Appraisal side, you know, we, everyone talks about you know, the appraisal plan and all that. Yeah, you don't know. So the buyer's like, oh wow, I got a great deal here. I can pay for this. Yeah. 
it's like you could choose anybody you wanted to, and they kind of be like, be like, hey, I really need a good trade one. I mean, so one of the changes I made there might be more. All right, guys, you guys have a, a good list going. Let's yeah. let's kind of let's quickly go through these uh, and try to brainstorm some of these. So uh, inspections and repairs. So what are some solutions you guys came up with? So surprise findings. What would, what would you say? Get a specialist. Get a specialist. Yep. Anything else? Get a second opinion. Yep. Um, maybe contact the inspector and just get his some more not some more information about it. Yep. Firsthand. Contact the inspector. Um, you could order a pre-inspection if you wanted to. I don't normally, but you can. So you could offer it to the seller if they wanted to. Does anyone do that? Free. Advocate the re-inspection, yeah. Yeah. What about uh, a, you get a if you get this inspection report and it's extremely complex and confusing? What are some solutions? Have the inspector go over it with you and the client together. What else? So, do you guys? Do you guys? Is there anyone that doesn't go to the inspection? about that oh I never do um, I I always I, I ask my lender I say what time do you want my client there and I'll have them come at the end of the inspection that's when I will be there I'm not gonna sit there for four hours I, think. I used to at one point in time and then I was like no way it was boring so Oh yeah, that's, that's good. Actually, you know what? That is a great point for the inspectors to use. You should ask them what their process looks like because it, it, a someone that is good at their job will have a process for it. And most inspectors do. So oh, that's actually a great point. So I'll just give my two cents what I do um, is I, I always show up at the end and I'm there when they go over with the client. Um, I always ask the client directly, all the inspectors there, is there anything that's on here that you don't understand or you have additional questions on before we leave? No. Great. And I go back to the inspector and I say, what would you say are the major items that we need to make sure not miss on this inspection? And then he gives the highlights of what he sees. Even if some of the inspectors say, I don't tell you what to fix. That's great. What do you see as the major items that I need to not overlook on this? Okay. And then I say, what do you think are the honeydew list on here that you mentioned. You know, hey, honey, when you get time, will you do this? I have the inspector do it. Lots. And then that way the inspector breaks it down super quick. The seller? Um, so, so, so if I'm on the seller side and I get a a report that's confusing. I mean, I'm calling the inspector and I'm asking him what he's talking about. Um, ask for pictures, you know, uh, especially because by the time it gets to the seller, there should be a list of like items they want to be repaired. So I only care about the ones that they're asking for. And then it, I'm calling the inspector, hey, do you have pictures? And if he doesn't have pictures, which most of the time they do now, um, if they don't, I'm going to go look at this. And if I have a contractor come out and look at it and that contractor can't find what you're talking about, can they call you so that way we fully understand what you're talking about? And he says yes. Okay, well, I'll let you know when they're going out there so you can expect a call. That's what I do. 
Um, what about cost and who pays? Negotiation, what do you mean? Yep. So it's, and what, what was your response? Take back on what he said. Oh, I was just saying um, in the closing costs and seller's concessions, um, you know, what would you guys be willing to put towards all these costs that are going to add up during this transaction? Yep. Other than these two over here, because we were part of the same conversation, um, <laughs> let's say you have a contract, it falls through, and the buyer done an inspection and they didn't pay for their inspection, and you didn't have earnest money. What happens? What could happen? Has anyone ran into a situation like that? And I hope they do. And most of the time they do now. They didn't used to. So in that scenario, if they didn't pay for it and they refused to pay for it, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not giving legal advice. I'm just saying the buyer or the any contract that does work on the house that doesn't get paid for can file a lien on the house, including an inspector. So I always make sure my clients know this if I'm representing the seller, that that is a risk they might be taking if there's not earnest money. If there is earnest money, I can make sure it's paid before I release the earnest money. But just a thought. I got caught on that one a time or two while I did it. Um, Timetable for repairs. Yeah. <coughs> Who pays for the inspection? Um, the buyer does. So um, a lot of times what they were saying is the uh, buyer will ask the seller to pay concessions, and that's part of the concessions. And ultimately, it's the buyer's responsibility. Okay. What about timetable for repairs? Things go wrong. Okay. Do an extension, amendment to the contract. Timetable messes up. Yep. So here, here's a question. Um, do you guys ask other agents who are some vendors that they have a lot of success with? Yeah, we. that's part of our new agent resources is just a big old list of the ones that Brian and Blake have used and had a lot of success with. That's good. I guess the question I have is, uh, are you asking about the opposing agent you're in the deal with? Because I, I, I've had that backfire on me. I was just meaning in general sense. Are are you asking other agents? Yeah, I had a we had a home that we were trying to purchase outside of my normal zone mm -hmm. of working, and didn't know any uh, termite inspectors in the area. Mm -hmm. So asked the other agent if they could refer one, and he just did not do the job. <laughs> and yeah, it just didn't work out well. That was a big mistake. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's keep moving. So, okay, what if your appraisal doesn't appraise out? We talked about that, actually, didn't we? Oh, loan funding. Okay. So, <laughs> what, it, what happens if your buyer gets pre-qualified through an online lender and they don't find they have the credit score to buy? I mean, I would think at that point you just kind of got to set expectations. Most people know, like where they're at roughly, but then you kind of got to work with a lender to just to establish a rebuilding plan and hope they come back when that's in good shape. I was a little bit joking because we were talking about a scenario, but um, <laughs> so, so, but if I'm just going to say anyone that has been in the business for very long has had that happen. So actually, I think everybody has that happen. If you're, everybody does. Um, my experience, let me check with another lender. Not every lender is the same, um, but it does happen, unfortunately, right? So, um, so just out of curiosity, uh, has anyone ever had someone not get approved through one lender and got approved through someone else? You have? So what's the reason? Anyone? It's kind of the same with... Um what Brian was talking about earlier is some different lenders have different processes and different qualification thresholds. 
Commander Rutters. So, so what do you mean by that? So let's talk about the, just for two seconds here, we talk about the, the risk. So does every lender have a certain risk category they want, don't want? Oh, I'm sure they do, yeah. yeah. But I think, again, I think that's, I think they're set based off of their investment groups that are investing in that company. Uh, I don't think the lender sets them themselves because they want to make money by selling the loan in the end. All great things, by the way. Great conversations. Um, so uh, what about, um, what do you do if, if you negotiate a repair addendum and the seller does the repairs, and you have a reinspection, and maybe something's not done, or it's not done the way you thought it would be done? You guys ever have that happen? Or is that a four letter word to talk about it? It happened to me. Uh, the, they wanted mold remediation under the house. They didn't specify, the buyer's agent didn't specify that it needed to be professionally done. So the homeowner did it himself, went under the house, cleaned the mold. Uh, the buyer was not satisfied with that and then wanted it professionally treated. Uh, so we negotiated a little bit, and I ended up under the house myself, uh, spraying it down, taking care of it, and taking pictures to satisfy that because I wasn't going back to my clients and saying, hey, now you have to have it professionally done. I think all of us have experienced that at some point, right? Now, I bring that up not to, to talk about that one situation, and how can we all make sure we are 1% better moving forward? What's that look like? Be specific. On the on the repairs, yeah. Uh, it have, and again, happened to me on the buy side. I asked for a new roof on a house. They agreed to a new roof, but then my client wanted to pick the color shingles. But I didn't say that in the inspection. Uh, so again, my fault, right? Uh, so we we worked it out and got it fixed. Uh, and it cost me a little bit of money to have it fixed to get the shingles changed uh, to make them happy. So. We've talked a little bit about communication in our processes. So when we talk about the other agent, are we asking for the expectations of when repairs are going to be done or who's doing it? So if you're on the buy side, just and this is just food for thought, I mean, when you agree on a repair addendum, I mean, are you, are you following up to say, hey, when is this work going to be done? Who are you guys hiring to do the work? Just a thought. It's good customer service because – if you don't find out at some point in time, your client's going to ask you, right? It goes back to making sure you have an answer before they think of the question. Okay, I'll slow down. What do you guys think so far? That We just went over like a whole lot of information. Thoughts? You can never be too specific, like on anything, ever. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. You just kind of, I don't know if this is later on in the, the presentation, but um, can you take us through like the, when you get to the closing table, what does that process look like? Um, you know, is it just, you know, signing paperwork? I mean, I, I, I bought a house like four years ago, but honest to God, I don't remember okay. what that looked like because I was just like, all right, where do I sign? You know, whatever. What does closing day look like? Yeah, what, is, what does it look like when you get to the table? Um, you know, money exchanges, um, things signed, you know, what does that look like? Because I've got one at the end of the month in February, so I just want to be prepared. It's a great question. So I, I will say at some point in time you should sit down with Sam or someone from yeah. the company. I'll give you the, the really short version of it, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, first, I'll, I'll tell you what I tell my clients. I say, what was your first name again? Patrick. Say, hey, Patrick, I just want to let you know the day of closing when we get there. So the buyer is going to sign first, and that portion is going to take 30 to 45 minutes. If it's a government loan, FHA, USDA, something like that, we're probably at 45 minutes if they haven't pre-signed documents already, which most of the time they don't. And so if – and then the seller's portion, 10, 15 minutes, we're out of there. Um, 
and I'll usually make some joke of you get your check and you can run, you know, it's whatever. Um, but uh, if I'm on the buy side, I'm making sure they know, hey, when you get there, just make sure you remember to bring your driver's license. Um, and if they're bringing money, make sure they're bringing money and they know who they're bringing the check to or bring the check out to. So great question. Um, this is where you need to rely on your lender. So once you write that contract, and I'm saying it because the little details could change based on like closing costs and stuff, right? Like they might have some prepaids that they might have paid the loan down. I don't know. Uh, they might have gotten a credit for something. So that amount could be different than that. So that's where you get the settlement statement. Always call my lender. So ask your lender, ask your title company. Um, so yeah, um, the short version, and if you're on the buy side and you get there, uh, you're going to sign documents for the title company. You're going to sign documents for the bank. Um, and then seller signs the warranty deed and then a handful of documents for the title company. Um, and yeah, the title company is the one that exchanges money. You don't. So, and as an agent, always make sure if you represent the seller, make sure you prepare them, bring all your keys and your garage door openers. You actually say, Hey Patrick here, if you want me to, I'll go hand the keys and garage doors opener. You take them. Cause I tell you, that's an uncomfortable moment and if isn't it has anyone ever had that like that moment at closing where everybody signed and everyone was just standing around like what what's next you know <laughs> like i always take it to the initiative and i just say hey you want to give me the keys garage door opener i'll go and i'll give them to them do you want to yeah do you know like, i might even say hey do you want to meet them you know sometimes the client wants to meet them sometimes they don't if they don't then i'll say well you just stay back here in the room i'll go over out here and then i'll give them the keys the short version. Did I answer your question on that? Yeah, Down money. Yeah. yeah. No. So the lender should tell the client, the buyer, how much money they need to bring to closing and who to make that check out to. Now it, it's got to be, um, it can't be just a handwritten check, right? They got to go get a cashier's check. Um, your lender should tell them but remember earlier we said you just assume they're not doing their job, right? You assume you got to ask them. So you make that assumption that I'm going to go ahead and call you and then say, hey, Patrick, you know our client, uh, uh, John and Mary over here, I just want to follow up and see um, how much money they need to bring to closing and have you went over the, that with them yet? You haven't. Great. Well, I was getting ready to call them. I just want to make sure if you had that, that you know, I didn't duplicate anything. Um, and might just verify how much is that they need to bring. Um, yeah, so. And driver's license. Yep. So I actually send out an email a couple of days before closing. I think we send it out three days before closing and it's what to expect at closing. And we do it for buyers and sellers. And it kind of goes over that right there, you know. Um, so like with a buyer, our the things that we send them is make sure you bring your driver's license. Um, you know, I say that because some people don't have a driver's license. I know that sounds crazy, but they don't. Like I've had this older couple and this guy's like, oh, I haven't had a driver's license in 10 years. <laughs> well, we got to find some ID then. <laughs> uh, I know that sounds crazy, but it, people, it's true. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, like on the buyer, two, so three days before I'm saying, send out an email reminding them to uh, bring their driver's license, make sure utilities are in their names, make sure they have a homeowner's insurance in place since that day. And it just goes over all that. And then I actually will call them. I, actually, my assistant will call them first. And then I'll normally call them like the morning of closing. And I'll just say, hey, I know you've gotten all this information. I just want to follow up and make sure you, you, you got to see it and you understood it. Um, I always, me personally, I want to go over the settlement statement like how the money's gonna be dispersed out with them. Like I wanna do it before we get to closing because my intention is Patrick, when you get to closing, I want this to be so easy and simple for you. You can say, I've already, I've already looked at that. I've already asked all the questions about that. So I want it to be that smooth and easy. So, and I tell my clients that. So I'll call them and I'll say, I'll go over it with you myself. And like some lenders, they should go over it with them. Don't always, so. Um, 
So dates to remember for a buyer, um, this is page 23 is where I'm at, by the way. Okay, so the effective date for, basically you don't forget your dates, your inspection deadline, um, inspection response. Uh, I would recommend, I mean, you, you had mentioned, go ahead and put it on your calendar. You know, when, when you get a contract, go ahead and put all this on your calendar immediately first thing. Um, and, you know, to go back actually, in some of these things, you can actually set up your own templates to do a drip campaign inside of command. And you can actually have it start day of a contract, you know, to go out, so just a thought. Um, your termite inspection, don't forget it, when that's supposed to be. And um, I'll just say, if you're on the seller side, um, you know, over communicate, over communicate, know when, like, it, who are they hiring to do the work? When is it supposed to be done? Uh, follow up with them on that day. Make sure it got done. Make sure they didn't have questions. Like Now, if you're writing an inspection notice and you have a relationship with, say, a roofer, do you will you specifically say this needs to be done by Dale's Roofing? So I, first I'm going to say, regardless of whatever I say, that's a Jim Bolin or Don Klepper question. Um, I typically don't because it's hard to force people to use your contractor. Um, I will be very specific that, you know, I want architectural shingles, four tab, or buyer to choose color, um, things like that. And want to, I want a company that provides a five-year warranty on it, whatever the case may be, and letting them know I'm going to do a reinspection on it. Okay, because uh, with my listing, you know, the, it's a 20-year-old roof, so even before we put it under contract, I was like, let's get some roofers out here to take a look, see, you know, just get an idea of what may come up. Yeah. Um, so we got some quotes, and then during the inspection uh, negotiation process, you know, before they sent it to us, the, the buyer's agent was like, you know, we're going to put something about this. Uh, we're going to put some information about this on the, roo on the roof that we want fixed. Um, and I sent her over a quote that we had got, a pretty fair quote. Yeah. And they accepted that. And they're like, all right, well, this is from Dale's. So we're going to use your quote from Dale's uh, roofing to do the repairs. Yeah. I mean, seller has the right to choose the yeah. whoever they want to do it. Um, I guess if you accepted, if you're on the seller side and you accepted a repair to name someone, you know, then you're obligated. But uh request anything you want to <laughs> doesn't mean it's acceptable yeah you're right you can you can request anything you want to <laughs> um I, i'll tell you what i do on this um so like on an inspection deadlines if i'm on the buy side uh i put a calendar reminder and i always actually put it the day before when my actual deadline is and i actually tell my clients we're, we're going to this is going to be our deadline. If it's 15 days, if it's on 14 days, because I want I want that extra day of leeway for what if something goes wrong. I just because sometimes things do go wrong. So, okay. I'm not doing a very good job with the code. So, uh, how can you make a good impression at closing? We talked a little bit about this earlier. And some teams do some really cool stuff. Some buyers agents do some really cool stuff on this. What, what are some ideas of how you can make a good opportunity or a, a good impression at closing? Closing gift. Great idea. Okay, well, what kind of closing gift? Um we, with a couple of experienced agents on our team, they're good at count. And we have a little sheet actually as part of the, like once they sign with us, we ask that they fill it out. You know, some of your favorite hobbies, treats, restaurants, whatever, you kind of look for those personal stuff. Yeah. And if, if in lieu of that, you can always give them a gift card to like home Depot or something like that. Those are pretty big go-tos. Um, just in the more personal we can make it the better. Cause that's going to, again, leave a, good impression for future business, things like that. So, okay, what are some other ideas? So I love all of that. So 
what are some ideas for at closing for how to leave a good impression? It could just be a specific gift that you've done or see other someone else do. Be early to closing. Okay, yeah. I love that. Yeah. So be early, meet them there at the door, take them water, take them to the room. Yeah, what else? Prior to closing, kind of set the expectations with your client that this is what's going to happen. So they're everyone's on the same page and it can go smoothly. And so they have any questions when, you know, it's time to sign something. They're like, what is this? Yeah, that's good. Yep. Go over beforehand. So someone said uh, Letitia Wooden has some awesome gift baskets here in the office. Look up Mockingbird Designs on Facebook. It's a cool idea. With their, with their permission, take a photo and blast it out on social media, tag a minute, yeah. kind of gets a buzz going. Yep. So let me ask you this. What's the emotion behind a buyer buying a house? Usually, usually excitement. Okay. What about a seller? Relief. Do you think about those things before you walk in the door? and meet them where they're at. That's a good thought. I know like a lot of people will match your emotions, by the way. Have you ever noticed that? I have you guys watched that, that documentary on, um, you know that movie Rudy? Did you see the documentary that just came out of him? Okay, well, it's on Netflix. Highly, highly recommend it, okay? Awesome. So I love the movie. The documentary was 10 times better. And it's him telling his his life story. And uh, man, what an amazing guy too. I, I won't ruin it by telling you know his story. Yeah, everyone should watch that. One thing though that he talks about, I was just like, man, I can't believe that. It's so cool. So what he does, he walks around. He, it's like he still goes on to campus and he just walks around and, and he just, do you even try not to smile and you <laughs> smile back at me? Like, if you just walk by, you don't even have to know them, and you smile at them, people smile back at you. And he said it's amazing how just a simple smile can change someone's whole day. Like, people feed off of your emotions. So I, I say all of that. You know, if I'm walking in and I know my buyers are excited, man, I'm excited too. I'm, I'm going to go above wherever they're at. Like, man, this is so awesome. What are you guys going to do when you first get there? Like, or, you know, a seller, okay. Man, I, I know you're going to be so relieved to have this over with. Yeah, and are you guys going to, like, do some celebration for finally having this off your back? Whatever. You know, I, I'm meeting them wherever they're at with their emotions. So, just a thought. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? This is something I thought about, you know, probably even before I got into real estate, but, you know, you, you as an agent, you buy, you know, you get a closing gift for your buyer, right? But on the sales side, that's not typically, that's not, you know, the typical case. Is, am I right? Like you don't usually present your seller with a closing gift. Is that, I mean, you can obviously, but is that standard practice? Well, I'll say it's your business. Yeah. You can create course, what yeah. you want. Yeah, but I'm just asking overall, you know, historically, you know, speaking. Um, <laughs> historically. <laughs> I would say majority of agents don't do anything uh, for either one. Um, okay. And if you want to give great customer service and you think of a really cool idea to give a seller with knowing where their emotional state is, yeah, do it. I guess I just only ask because, you know, on the internal page, people are always posting, uh, posting pictures of them and their buyer, you know, but um, not as much with the, uh, the seller. So just a question. Mike Brown said he always does. So for both sides. There's probably more posts with buyers because the excitement level versus like sellers that they're more relieved. So if you're excited, you can kind of feed into that. Yeah. Okay, well, let's just for a second. I mean, if you have a seller, what with knowing that they're, this is a relief to get this thing sold and assuming they're not buying something else, 
for a year or whatever the case is, what, what kind of gift could you give them? What does Mike Brown do? What do you think? What could you do? They, they still probably want to celebrate just to be over a massive hurdle. So, I, again, I think, like, the restaurant or a bottle of booze that they like or whatever could go a long way. Yeah. Not really very practical, but it's fun. Spa day. <laughs> Spa day. That's a great idea. What else? <laughs> Anything else? Oh, it's a celebration. For some reason, those comments aren't showing up. Yes. <laughs> we asked what, what your gift was for sellers. Okay. I do something a little different um, with both sides. I do a gift certificate to a local restaurant. A friend of mine runs it, and this is the best part of it. Because I tell people, I know you got to move a bunch of stuff. Last thing you want is a plant or a fern, which used to be the main gift people would give. Um, but the thing with this, the arrangement with my friend, if they never come and use the certificate, it doesn't cost me anything. So I only get charged once they, once they actually use it. But, you're just, you know, just think of something you like doing or something that, you know, personal. I love Letitia's... Uh, baskets upstairs but but for the sellers i do the same thing and it's based on uh the gift card or the gift certificate value is based on value of the house and if they're doing a buy-in a sell and all that kind of stuff but the ideal thing is i don't pay unless they go use it because i think it's like i think it's like 80 percent of people never use gift cards that are given to them so you know it's like hey go have a nice steak dinner and if they never do good for me <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Mike. What's that? <laughs> so I'll end my, uh, this one section. I'll, I'll stop talking about this one section. We'll move on to the next section with this one last thought. So remember that whether it's a buyer or seller, like the height of their emotion is right now. Like this is the height of their emotion and reminding them hey, I love working with people just like you. You know, if you know somebody, you come in and ask for a referral. Um, follow up, you know, um, follow up, follow up, follow up. Man, I, it is, I actually prefer the follow up call 30 days after than I do the actual day of closing. Because if it's done right and you call them 30 days after or two weeks after and 30 days after and, you, and they say, man, I'm so glad you called. How have you been? I, you know, I was just telling so-and-so the other day how easy of a process this was. I had that call yesterday, and I just followed up with someone. And it just, man, it, that's gratifying. And, and knowing that you created this relationship, and it's like, okay, they want you to call. So, so that follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. Yeah? I was talking to, to Brian Stone about, you know, um, kind of the same deal. And he had brought up, you know, his, he's got some advice is um, after you close, um, more so on the buyer side, but keep all the paperwork that you've got because, you know, he had a friend or somebody that he had done business with that bought a house, called him like two months later and it was like uh, there was some kind of issue with the, the house. But they were like, oh, what do I do? But he had all the paperwork from like the home warranty and stuff like that. So he was like, here, just call this person. I've got it right here. I'll send it over to you. And it was taken care of. So. Speaking of home warranties, um, you guys ever had an experience with home warranties? My advice, understand them and know who to call. <laughs> so I, I've had some amazing experiences and some not so amazing experiences. Just know who to call. So um, anything wrong. Just kidding. So HSA and used to have George, right? So George is someone. Um, I know George is with another company, and um, George Brock, George Brockman, right? Anyways, George is awesome. I've called him after hours for stuff. I just know who the person is you need to call if something goes wrong because your client's going to call you if something goes wrong. They will call you and say, hey, you remember that 
home warranty you sold me? And you're like, I didn't sell it to you. I just told you about it. Like, no, 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 you sold it to me. Well, <laughs> I've had that call. And I'm like, I don't remember. You signed a piece of paper at closing. But no one who to call. Highly, highly recommend that. So I thought this was on there, but I, I'll just I'll read it to you. Um, so the NAR reports that 88% of clients say they would use the real estate agent again, but only 12% do. Don't be that 76% that loses touch with past clients. I've been hearing that forever, ever, ever, ever. I remember an agent in this office telling me that uh, <laughs> he even, um, if it's not a Keller Williams agent, obviously, he even adopts the clients on the other side of the deal. And starts sending them stuff and creates relationships with them um, just because most agents don't stay in touch. So, interesting. So, who would, re would you read this one for me? Agents have two agendas. One, to move the current transaction towards a successful closing, and two, to ensure referrals. Most agents don't get that. Yeah. Oh, it does have a agenda. Sorry. So, yeah, that was that stat I was telling you about. So, isn't it interesting that 88% said they would use their agent and only 12% do? What do, you, what do you guys think about that? Not following up? Not Yeah. So that's kind of like what you were talking about. Like, like if I was to go out on a date with someone, and we had this really great date, and then I just never called her again. Like, what would she think about me? <laughs> yeah, so. And I would say our clients, same, feel, feel the same way. Okay, so ha how have... How have your thank you cards been going? You guys been doing that? You guys writing cards, thank you cards? Not as much as you should. So I thought there was actually a slide on this, but it's not. Um, what do you think the client feels when they get a thank you card? Or a friend, you know, someone in your sphere, what do you think, what do they think when they get your card? You had a warm fuzzy. Okay, this is a little bit random or off script just a little bit. But I want you to think about this because this is truly what I believe. How many people really tell you what they're thankful for with when it comes to you? Or what they're grateful for when it comes to you? It never gets that deep or usually doesn't just a thought. I mean, I'm sorry, I forget. What was your first name? Brian. Brian. So, I mean, like, Brian, man, I've got so much respect for anybody that's been in the military. And I know the sacrifice it takes. Are you married? Yes. You are. Were you married when you're in the service? Yep. And I know it's hard for your family, too, right? Sure. Did you deploy when you're? Multiple times, yes. Did you really? Yep. Oh, wow. Where did you deploy to? Uh, Pakistan, Iraq, and Kuwait. I have a lot of appreciation for everything you've done and your family because I genuinely know that's hard. And I know to do what you've done and your family's done takes a lot and it has a big heart. Thank you. I truly mean that. And, I mean, how many people take the time to slow down and actually let other people know how they feel? I mean, I just had this conversation with my son just the other day. Matter of fact, <laughs> I told my son, I got into my son, and I had this exact conversation, and I actually told him if he didn't go and tell everyone in the family what he was grateful for, he was grounded. <laughs> like, I was like, dude, we just, we're going to change this. It's, we're going to change a few things, yeah. So another way to do this, and I've done this, you know, for years now, uh, and if you ever run into somebody who's been to Vietnam, just tell them welcome home. Yeah. 
they've never heard that fucking home. When when the Vietnam vets came home, they were spit on and they were trashed. Tell them welcome home. And that really that really invokes a emotional response from them from that generation. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. So, okay, so as we talked about this a little bit, so what are you thinking now with your with your thank you cards? Just to be more intentional. Exactly like you demonstrated there, you know, connect when you've connected with them as you probably well you should have at some point during the process, you'll have a more genuine approach to your thank you. Ooh, that's true. Um, you know, and not, you know, I, the, writing thank you cards, you know, to your clients after closing, things like that. But something I've been doing um, in the first few months is um, when I was showing my, my buyer's homes, if it, if it wasn't vacant, if I knew they were still living there, I would write them a thank you card, you know, for, for allowing us to, to show your home. And, you know, okay. thanks for being, um, you know, um, willing to, to help us out and actually i've got a somebody they were tenants at the time they weren't the homeowners but um i've actually got some business from them just based off just off the card alone you know thanks for yeah. being so um you know thanks for working with us basically by the way who doesn't like a compliment i mean i i so i sent one yesterday to uh a sphere and i was just like hey man i've got so much respect for the dad you are to your kids and i just gave him examples and just said man I, I that's just one thing about you i've always looked up to and thought it was so amazing how how good of a dad you are and how much you loved your wife that's all my thank you was and then i followed up with it you know so anyways okay so let's take a couple minutes you guys have your your cards with you today no <laughs> okay Okay, how about you write out, who are you gonna write a thank you card to and what would the gratitude you would tell them? And that way when you get your cards, then you already have it planned out and you don't have to think about it. Oh, sorry. How are you? Good. Oh. Oh, oh, we're taking a break, we're writing thank you cards. into this one.
send a thank you card to? Let's just say you're a new, new agent and you don't have uh, past clients yet. A, a new agent could send thank you cards to anyone who's helped them. Like, you know, you're going to need help when you start out. So send thank you cards to those people. Okay. Who else? I just thought I had an aha for myself. Um, again, as an admin position, I, I'm going to send thank you cards to whoever the other agent is on the other side of the deal. 100%. Go back to what we talked about earlier about how important it is to have a good relationship with the other agent. I mean, could you send one to the title company for doing a good job of closing? Could you send a thank you card to the lender? Could you send a thank you card to a vendor? It's teachers. Thank you card. So by the way, write this thank you card. What if you don't have their address? How are you going to get their address? Huh? Fastpeoplesearch.com. Okay. What, what, what do we find on fastpeoplesearch.com? That's where I was going with it, is tax records. That's what I do. So I just look them up on the tax records and get their address. Make sure you pay attention to site address as opposed to mailing address because <laughs> if they own more than one property, um, mail it to the wrong one. So, um, yeah. And so you let's, – let's just use this as an example. Let's say you have um, – let's just – not not an agent, but let's just say it's a, your kid's teacher, or your a vendor you use, something like that. You send them a thank you card. You find their address. What do you do then? What do you do with their information? Contact. If your seller uses Dale's Roofing, and you sent Dale's Roofing a thank you card for doing such an amazing job. Put them in there. Put everybody in there. Just, just a reminder. So on page 30, it talks about um, what to do with, like, having a timeline. So uh, add your buyers, sellers, clients to your database, your vendors. So I, I would suggest you have a system so everybody write down, and I don't, I'm not telling you what you write down in your system. Just everybody write down when you want to do these things. So you get a new buyer. When are you adding them to your database? You have a new vendor. They do some work on a property. When are you putting them in your database? Do you have a system for what, how you're going to start the relationship with them? I, I don't care what you choose. Just choose something. Aaron said that she sends cards and texts to friends who have been supportive along the way uh, to get her license. That's actually really great. Sorry, Aaron, I didn't see that earlier. Okay, page 31. So we've talked about a lot of different things in here. Would it, uh, who in here has been through a contracts class? About half the room. Who's been through the contracts class since they changed the contracts? So I would say put on here, like, I would probably go through the contract class as quick as possible. I know they made some adjustments. I think Jim Bowen talked about it a couple weeks ago. 
Um, they made some adjustments on the contract. So always good. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, I've been in the business for 16 years and I still find it beneficial. So, and I'll tell you, we are very blessed to have both Don Klepper and Jim Bowling because not every broker just has brokers that are that knowledgeable and that willing to help. So, yeah, that Don offers, yeah. So 100%. And matter of fact, come with questions. Like, come with questions and say, here's a question I have on the contract. Um, 100%. Are these on uh, the calendar on the Market Center website? Where do you find these dates and stuff? I'm not finding them. It, it's also on the internal Facebook page. So they sent an email, um, but it's you can go on the internal Facebook page and they've got uh, a calendar on there for all of the trainings they've got. Um, hundred percent, um, or ask Rachel or ask Don when his next class is. Uh, I mean, I would, if it were me, go to it more than once. Like you, you'll learn so much. So, uh, on page 31, it kind of goes through, I would write down when you're going to have each one of these done by and have this in what I'm gonna call a growth plan for yourself, a growth plan for your business, making sure that you're taking this time because I promise you we're going to get to summertime and it is going to be crazy, crazy busy. I would be very intentional with my time. I am right now, I'm being very intentional with my time and preparing so that way when I get to these moments, I'm ready to run. And you, how long have you been in real estate, did you say? 16 years. Okay, what were some, I mean, I know a lot has changed since then, but what were some of the things that you really keyed in on as a new agent? Um, or maybe some things that you wish you had that you, you know, later, you know, kind of studied up on, but, um, you know, initially what some things? So I started at a small brokerage. Um, my dad had, my dad was a broker and had a commercial company. And when I got licensed, <laughs> my dad took a contract that he had closed he printed it, stapled it, and the day of hearing, he said, I want you to memorize this, and when you have this memorized, come back and talk to me, and then I'll answer any question. Until you have this memorized, he's like, don't come talk to me. I go ask my dad a question. I'm like, man, I'm struggling to find business. He's like, it's line 157, sir. I don't know, Dad. I'm like, well, you don't deserve a referral. <laughs> True story. <laughs> my dad was old school tough, mean. No, he wasn't. He was a good guy. Um, I, I'm very thankful for that. It was, it sucked um, at the moment. And I, it forced me to learn like the important things of the contract and um, know what the language is. Because until I did that, like I didn't really know the questions to ask. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And he forced me to really read and, and learn like the language around the inspections. You know, like the important, it's all important. And you know what I'm saying? Like, the parts where you can adjust it, um, you just have to understand the language and what it means. Because if you don't understand the language, then then you don't know how to change it. But that was something that was something really good. It sucked at the time, and it was something really good. Something I wish I'd done. But um, I think the things that in the beginning, I wish in the beginning I would have slowed down a little bit more. Um, I wish I would have taken a little bit more time in the beginning to really understand the process and the contracts. I think that, and not that I had deals go bad, I just, man, those first half a dozen, probably the first year, I mean, in looking back, I just think my, my clients deserved a better experience than I gave them. And not that it, not that I wasn't trying and not that I didn't want it for them. I just, at the time, didn't understand that to slow down and and learn the contracts, learn the process. Uh, because when I did that, then I guess I, I was better equipped to help them. And I'll even say something I probably four years ago, a learning moment I had was um, I took the opportunity. I'm like, like what, what do my clients, what do they really want? What do they, when they, 
Like when they're hiring a real estate agent, what do they really want? They just want someone to sell them a house because that's not the truth. And there are 3,000 agents in our area. I'm like, what do they really want when they're shooting? And, and you know what? I never asked them. <laughs> I, I always ask, what are you looking for in an agent to represent you? you know, like what's, what's important to you? Because if I don't know, I don't know how to help. Not that I'm perfect, and I still need to be a lot better. And don't ask, you don't know. I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. So who in here has, who's been on command and looked at command? Do you guys use command? Okay. Do you... Do you guys understand like how to set someone up on drip campaigns? Vaguely? Getting pretty knowledgeable about smart plans, but that's about the extent of what I'm on. Yeah. Yeah, smart plans. Yeah. Um, I I'll mention if this isn't in here, this is just my experience. You know, the Keller Williams offers a an intense command class that you can pay for when you get when you get ready to to dive in a little bit more, I think it's like four hundred fifty, five hundred bucks. It's like twelve weeks. Um, it's an hour session a week for twelve weeks, um, and they and it's a small group through Zoom, and they walk you through how to do everything inside of command. So, I don't know if you're like me and you looked at command and you're like, "This sucks," because <laughs> I didn't know how to use it, and then I I paid that and. Still challenging, and oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Dan does. And Mike said that at Family Reunion they have some command specific classes. Sixty six day, yeah. I think they actually even have an updated version of the sixty six day challenge. So. Okay, so page 32, what is your mission for the next week? Somebody. Okay, I love that. So on page 32, this talks about, you guys have that 32? Okay, in the middle of the page, it says, pearls of wisdom. By, does Mike Thorne want to read it? Interview up to five successful agents in your market center and ask, what is your advice on getting into effective and sustainable production as soon as possible? And what is your secret to longevity and prosperity in the real estate business? That's good. Who are five people you could interview? Anybody? Any of the uh, previous and current Ignite instructors would come to mind. Okay. Uh, past ALC members, current ALC members, um, investors in the market center. true yeah uh, you're 100 percent right yeah everybody in this market center would have so so okay let's kind of just recap a little bit so page 33 what are the four-step process outlined in this chapter to have a successful closing i don't remember i'm going back to look at them <laughs> one at a time it is okay, we how about uh, we've talked about one thing over and over and over. Just effective communication. I know that's come up a lot. 
has, you're right. So know the process, know the process, um, have a system. And I think in, in here it calls it seize the golden opportunity. I'll say just taking the opportunity, you know, to leave a good relationship with or good um, impression on your clients, ask for referrals, how to do it, what do you do with the information once you get it, communication, and then know the know how to get paid, by the way. <laughs> so what's the market center's process for getting paid, getting compliance? Um, why is closing a good time to ask for a referral and testimony? Emotions are high and they're happy. Yeah. Emotions are high and they're happy. When's another good time in the process to ask them for a referral or testimony? Sign contract? Well, why then? When's another good time to ask for it? Okay. Good answer. Anytime there's a win. I like that. So who are your resources here in the market center if you have questions? you have like administrative questions, they're always upstairs ready to help you. If you've got yeah, any contract or closed transaction questions, there's a plethora of agents who are always willing to help. Oh, there's a list. Oh, the on call. have coaches in this market center and i know they're listening they're they're okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so brian um tim mike brown right you got your team leader your assistant team leader don klepper jim yep um what about the person whoever the person is that you signed up under their name your sponsor, whoever that person is. Who did she sign up under? Oh. <laughs> Just a thought, anyways. So um, I say that because, I mean, that person wants you to su succeed just as much as anybody. How many contacts are you supposed to have in your database by the end of Ignite? Three hundred. I think I think it's two hundred plus is what they say. Where are you guys at so far? Do you know? Or maybe it was two hundred up to this point, and yeah, that's what it was. Just a thought. Okay, give me um, give me some ahas or takeaways from the day. Um, actually, Garrett back there gave me a good idea while we were going through one of the lists, the the problem mm -hmm. solving ones. That again, admin guy thinking, but like if if um, another agent is struggling, come to come to them from more of a place of. Um, support versus because i'm sure speaking about a new agent i'm sure they're probably intimidated if they know they got someone on the other side who's experienced or whatever come to them from a place of support and they found that that gets good results when they're struggling with um working with another agent from another agency that's a very specific one but yeah win-win find the win-win what else somebody else the takeaway um you know obviously having a system is important but i think you really drove it home with how you know many different 
systems you can have, you know, um, you know, the thank you cards, for example, you know, time block some time every week to write thank you cards, have a list for that. Um, you know, the, the, the checklist all the way from sign to, to closing, you know, um, and I think it's just important to be organized and, you know, that that's going to make it easier on everybody in the long run. Yep. What else? Give me a couple other ahas, and if you do, I, I've got one more thing to share with you that someone told me that was very powerful. I'll just say I was a MAPS coach, and this was something that Gary Keller was talking to us and said this. And when he said it, I was like, whoa. A couple more ahas. Maybe one from Zoom, too. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I, uh, the, the seize the golden opportunity. In my last job, we were obligated to write thank you cards after a certain trigger event. And n almost never did I make them personal. Like it was always, hey, thanks for coming by. Thanks for doing this. Let me know if you need anything. And so that's, that was just a good reiteration of how powerful a personal connection can be and what that can do for you personally and professionally. That's true, yeah. Either of you two from the back row? Aha, uh -huh. takeaway? Yeah, I just, I, I'm very like tactical in how I approach things and so I think the system uh, idea makes a lot of sense to me and I also like making it easier on my buyer by like writing it down. So that's like, hey, this is what it looks like. This is, we're gonna check in in between here and uh, I just think that'd be really beneficial. And I also liked what uh, Mike said, whenever you, you know, do like the home anniversary, quarterly birthday, monthly neighborhood, kind of stuff like that. Um, getting those touches in, because that's like 18 touches a year where not even really having to think and it's happening. So I thought that was good. You know, another thing of why I like the handwritten is, do you know that some people are um, audio, audible learners and some people are visual learners? Like, have you ever had someone say, I see what you're saying, as opposed to I hear what you're saying? Because our minds work different, and some people have to see it, and some people have to hear it. Like, that's some people love Audible. And then some people, like myself, I have to read it. I can list to an Audible. I won't remember it. If I read it, though, I can picture what the page looked like and what the sentence structure looked like. Like, I can, I can envision it. But if you tell me, I don't remember. And I say that it's nice when you're sitting down with a client, if you give it to them in writing also, because you don't know if they're an audible learner or visual learner. And, and if you tell it to them, they might just be in one ear out the other. Um, but if you give it to them on paper, it's just a thought. Gives them something to reference back to. Yeah. I liked what you said about your son, you know, like how to preset maybe problems that might arise so the buyers or sellers will kind of already be aware of that so they're not like oh man like you suck or so, you know like they they don't have to put blame anywhere like they can kind of like hey well you know you did tell me about that so like I don't know that that's that worked for me and I, even so much so so when what was your first name Christy, Christy so Hey, Christy, just wanted you to know, um, I know we're making an offer on this, and I just want to kind of let you know what this is going to look like when we get this under contract, is we're going to have two negotiations through this process. One, when you get it under contract with price and terms of the contract, and second, when we're going to agree on what repairs need to be made. Just want to make you aware of a second uh, negotiation that will be coming in about 10 or 15 days. I make sure I lay that on heavy, and then if you're the seller, I'm going to say, just so you know, things always come up on the inspections and anything can be fixed. Anything can be repaired, just no matter how much and just letting them know, so setting the expectation. Um, okay, anything else? Okay, so here's what Gary Keller said to us. Um, so you guys know the MREA, the models of, of the team levels, right? So you've, you've got you know, one through seven, right? And, your seventh level agent, they're out of the business, right? Okay. And Gary was like, actually, 
So Gary was like, you've got to get people back into their database. You've got to get them intentional. Your business is only your database and the systems you have in place. That's it. When you want to grow your business, you work on your database and your systems inside of your business. You focus there. That's the foundation. You don't have that. You don't have a business. I don't care how many people are on your team. You don't have a business you, if you don't have a database or systems that are in place. If you think about what you grow from and the foundation you have to build on, it has to be those two things. I was like, hmm. And he was very just, I don't know if you guys ever listened to Gary, he's just very matter of, of fact about it. And so he also said, um, I thought this was really great too, and it was in that same conversation. And he was like, build great systems and really invest in your success team, your admin team, like really invest in them because those are the people that your clients at the end of the day will have raving reviews on if done right with right systems. I was like, changed my thinking just a little bit on that. So anyways, anyone on Zoom have any takeaways, ahas, or anyone else in here? Okay. Guys, thank you. Appreciate you coming. And yeah.